solar obliquity induced by Planet Nine, Elizabeth Bailey, Michael Brown, and Constantin Batagen. Let me read this to you real quick. This is at the Cornell University Library. And this is a pretty big deal, in my opinion. This has been talked about a little bit before, but I don't know how much detail has actually gotten out to the public or been given to the public in this. I mean, there's been papers and articles that have been written, but most of those articles came from this specific document. So let me read this to you real quick. This was submitted July 14th last year. The sixth degree obliquity of the sun suggests that either an asymmetry an asymmetry was present in the solar system's formation environment or an external torque has misaligned the angular momentum vectors of the sun and the planets. However, the exact origin of this obliquity remains an open question. Batagen and Brown have recently shown that the physical alignment of distant Kuiper Belt objects can be explained by a 5 to 20 Earth mass planet on a distant eccentric and inclined orbit with an approximate perihelion distance probably said that word wrong I'm sorry of 250 astronomical units using an analytic model for secular interactions between planet 9 and the remaining giant planets here we show that a planet with similar parameters can naturally generate the observed obliquity as well as the specific pole position of the sun's spin axis from a nearly aligned initial state thus planet 9 offers a testable explanation for the otherwise mysterious spin orbit misalignment of the solar system you can read about this just search engine solar obliquity induced by planet 9 so what it is saying there essentially is there's a planet that's 250 astronomical units away five to 20 times the size of the Earth that is causing the entire solar system to tilt. I'd also like to bring up one of the main researchers and people that have discovered Planet Nine and the way that it's causing all of this interaction with our solar system is Michael E. Brown. Michael E. Brown is also an American astronomer who basically downgraded or helped <laughs> downgrade Pluto in these scientific realms. Now, he even wrote a book called How I Killed Pluto, and why it had it coming, published in 2010. You can read about him on Wikipedia. And I'll just give you a quick rundown. He's been a professor of planetary astronomy at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, since 2003. His team discovered many trans-Neptunian objects, notably the dwarf planet Iris. According to Wikipedia, this is the only known TNO more massive than Pluto. So that's why he refers to himself as the man who killed Pluto, because he furthered Pluto being downgraded to a dwarf planet in the aftermath of the discovery of Iris and several other possible planets. So now Planet Nine is the culprit to causing the solar system to shift on its axis. Now, I find it fascinating that something that far away can have so much impact on the sun and enormous planets here in our solar system. Now, let's look at the fact that that hasn't caused a pull shift yet. The planet's still in good shape. We're still healthy. We still have a lot of good things going for us, so it's nothing to freak out about. It's something to be aware of and hope for the best. And another really interesting article that I pulled up, I'm going to talk to you guys about something a little bit different right now. This is an article on Activist Post. It's called, Police Now Talk to Use Smart Appliances and Gadgets in Crime Investigations. They're essentially using smart appliances now to track people's movements and in court cases if you have an appliance that's hooked up to the internet a lot of these appliances now literally have cameras built into them like the new samsung that's called a family hub where it keeps track of what's in the fridge also what's outside of the fridge and i think it's good that these kind of technologies can be used if somebody goes out and commits a horrific crime don't get me wrong and i also think people need to be aware of the possibility of spygate essentially I mean, if you've got this kind of stuff in your house Obviously, there's going to be certain factions in security realms that will keep track of that kind of stuff with algorithms and supercomputers and software, AI, etc., looking for certain words. And we also got to consider the possibilities of there being just rogue factions, even if you know about Chinagate, essentially millions of microchips that have been put in very sensitive computers in the defense industry as well as corporate industries and residential industries. 
all of the above that can be hacked via external sources. And they've found a lot of people have noticed that China is the culprit because they're producing these chips that are put into these sensitive data hubs and then they can pull that information and spy on the U.S. So this kind of stuff now with these Samsung hubs and all these different smart appliances and webcams everywhere, etc. You know, how easy would it be for a hacker or somebody from another country to tap in and spy on the American people? It would be a piece of cake. I remember seeing a few years ago, this guy was on 60 Minutes or some TV show where he was driving down the street and he had this like wand, essentially it was some type of technology that he could point it at a house and if somebody had a webcam at that house, it could pick up the webcam. It would, it would actually see through that webcam. So that's why you hear stories about people <laughs> that work for intelligence agencies putting tape over their web camera. How far are they going to go with this kind of stuff? And do you guys think it's a good thing? Do you think it's a bad thing? Do you, are you willing to put a whole bunch of cameras in your house for updates on your, your milk and when you need eggs? Is it that important to you? Because obviously they're charging thousands of dollars for these appliances and I get it. I mean, I can get the cool factor. I just wonder how far it's going to go with the 1984 type scenario with technologies beyond our wildest dreams, integrated with supercomputers, algorithms, et cetera, who's controlling things to the top level? And does that person decide, okay, well, if you hear anything through these hubs or you see anything through these hubs with these AI algorithms that disagree with my agenda, and I'm referring to whoever it is that's controlling the apex here, then think of the intelligence they would have essentially to use that against you. Meaning they know everything about you. They know what's going to freak you out. They know what's going to make you happy. They know what's going to make you sad. They know where you're going to go. They know what you're going to do. They know when you get a drink. They know when you turn on the TV. They know when you open a book. They know what kind of food you like. They know what your friends are like. They know what your friends' friends are like. And they can put profiles on you and essentially use that against you without you even knowing it. Be very good for marketing companies, obviously. You know, here's another option. Here, sell it to a uh, hundred different companies. Okay, this person eats this goes to the fridge at 8 o'clock, so maybe you want to give him these commercials at 8 o'clock to, to stimulate his hunger, to go out and spend more money, consumer-driven society that we live in. That can be connected to the search engines that you look up. So let's say, for example, you type in kombucha tea near me because you like to drink kombucha tea. Well, based upon the profile that that computer and search engine already has on you because everything's all interconnected, it will then decide where to show you the kombucha is, or if it wants to show you kombucha, maybe it'll decide to pull up some new tea that's out there because there's this business that's dropping X amount of dollars for advertising. I say, okay, we'll get you the, we'll get you the clientele. Great. How do they do it? Well, they profile people and they say, okay, well, we're going to market to that person. And then they can market in a way where you wouldn't even know it. Imagine that. Imagine if Everybody right now, yourself, myself, other people that are listening to this podcast everywhere around the world that uses technology, imagine the possibilities of integrated, individualized, each person specifically when they type something in a search engine is custom tailored to that specific person, not just based upon their search history, but based upon all the smart appliances, all the cell phones, all the internal information that's been compiled over the years and put into literally giant databases that can filter through it. And then who decides who gets that information? Is it going to be like the wild west? A little bit different where anybody has enough money or enough hacking abilities can get that information on that person. And then you can say, well, I've got nothing to hide. I follow the laws. I'm a good person. I don't care. Well, what if you disagree on a religious belief? Or maybe you're not religious. Maybe you disagree on a political belief. Or maybe you're not political. Maybe you disagree on... Hmm. Maybe you disagree because the job that you have, they've got you working in, a, in, in squalor conditions. And you're forced to go to work because if you don't go to work, they'll essentially make you work via concentration camp because they've got all the technology now and everybody's plugged into this Borg type system. They know how to use your personality against you, use your profile against you, make you think you're bad when you're good, make you think you're good when you're bad, make you think that you're a, a Barney Rubble, make you think you're Fred Flintstone. They know everything about you. They've had technologies now for at least 70 years that I know about where they could take sound waves of specific brain waves. Essentially, they would record brain waves and patterns, 
put it into sound form, blast that out into audiences of protesters that would make their minds go mad because that would overlay their brain input, their, I'm sorry, imprint, which is also input. It would overlay that with a different frequency, which would change the way that they think, which in turn made them crazy in that area. So they dispersed. That's just with a frequency of some, of some, it was, I think they were using frequencies of chimpanzees or something that were under distress, that were being tortured. Now imagine that kind of technology combined with what we're talking about here with supercomputers and algorithms and calculations calculating over 300,000 quadrillion floating points per second. Individualized artificial intelligence software. They could have sims on everybody and play out these characters in different scenarios. Maybe that's what they do on a grand scale. Maybe it's not as personalized for them. Maybe it's more on a, okay, we're going to look at what we can do with this population over here in this zip code. We're going to take the people in, in France because we know what, what makes them tick, what makes them think in those certain blocks and certain areas. This isn't science fiction anymore. So smart appliances are turning people into stupid humans. Smart appliances, smartphones, stupid people, stupid humans. How far are we willing to let this technology advance? And the question is, I'm all for technology. I think technology is fantastic. I love it. Who's, who has control of this technology and where is the balance factor going to be? That's why I bring these questions up and ask these questions because it helps stimulate thought The good possibilities, the bad possibilities. Who decides? We decide. We just have to be informed. With that said, I uh, appreciate you guys listening to this presentation. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine timelord. Also become a contributing member at leakproject.com. Help support Leak Project and question everything. Be aware and be the change you want to see. Solar obliquity induced by Planet Nine. Elizabeth Bailey, Michael Brown, and Constantin Batagen. Let me read this to you real quick. This is at the Cornell University Library. And this is a pretty big deal in my opinion. This has been talked about a little bit before, but I don't know how much detail has actually gotten out to the public or been given to the public in this. I mean, there's been papers and articles that have been written, but most of those articles came from this specific document. So let me read this to you real quick. This was submitted July 14th last year. The six degree obliquity of the sun suggests that either an asymmetry, an asymmetry was present in the solar system's formation environment or an external torque has misaligned the angular momentum vectors of the sun and the planets. However, the exact origin of this obliquity remains an open question. Batagen and Brown have recently shown that the physical alignment of distant Kuiper Belt objects can be explained by a 5 to 20 Earth mass planet on a distant, eccentric, and inclined orbit with an approximate perihelion distance, I probably said that word wrong, I'm sorry, of 250 astronomical units using an analytic model for secular interactions between planet nine and the remaining giant planets here we show that a planet with similar parameters can naturally generate the observed obliquity as well as the specific pole position of the sun's spin axis